Hello everybody, welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and uh, I've got a couple topics of interest today and one is antibiotics, the gut microbiota and children's health. Children who take antibiotics during the first two years of life have an increased risk of both hay fever and eczema according to recent research and the data for the first part of this uh, information I'm going to share uh, were presented at the European Respiratory Society International Congress 2016. So it hasn't yet hit a journal but it was presented at a conference. The analysis included cohort, case control, cross-sectional studies published between January 1966 and November of 2015. So it's a fairly large amount of evidence that was looked at, included over 500,000 children. And here's what they found. The effect was dose dependent. The children who took two or more courses of antibiotics had a higher risk of hay fever and eczema than the children who took only one. And so as a result of this, the researchers recommend that doctors exercise a lot more caution in the prescribing of antibiotics to children. I think they should exercise caution in prescribing antibiotics to anyone. I think there is a little bit more of that going on, but we really need to be much more diligent. The increased incidence of bad events uh, when taking antibiotics is in part due to the effect of antibiotics on immune function. Lead researcher Dr. Fariba Amadiza says, quote, gut microbiota are thought to play an important role in the development of the immune system early in life and reduce gut microbial diversity by exposure to antibiotics in early infancy leads to the imbalanced Th1 and Th2 response which is related to an increased risk of allergies and other immune-related disorders. In other words, you mess up the gut, you mess up the immune system. That's basically what she's saying. Now, the strength of her arguments here are that there are so many other studies that have shown the same thing. For example, research conducted by a pharmacist by the name of Brian Love showed that taking antibiotics during the first year of life increased the risk of food allergies. Love said, it is well known that antibiotics can disrupt the normal flora of the skin, respiratory system, and gastrointestinal tract, and researchers are just beginning to understand the potential effect that these antibiotics have on the alteration of the microbiome, and then he goes on to talk about the interaction of the microbiome and immune function. By age one, adverse changes to the, uh, to the microbiome can promote inflammation and increase the risk that a child will develop allergies by the age of two, and asthma by the age of four. And this is according to one of the first studies that looked at this issue in human infants instead of just conducting the research in animals. Researchers analyzed stool samples from 130 babies at one month and then 168 infants at about six months of age. They looked at the children's responses to, uh, to uh, 10 different food and airborne allergens at two years of age. Three different neonatal microbiota states were identified. Children at age two who had lower levels of beneficial bacteria and higher levels of, back, of uh, pathogenic bacteria and uh, fungal um, substances tended to be allergy prone. And those same children who were more prone to allergies had lower levels of anti-inflammatory fatty acids and breast milk derived oligosaccharides than children from the lower risk gut microbiome categories. The research group took the additional step of mixing healthy immune cells from adult donors with metabolites from the allergy-prone children, and the cell cultures produced more inflammation promoting T cells associated with allergies and reduced T regulatory cells, which suppress allergic response. What they basically did was identify a mechanism of action for how changes in the microbiome can induce immune dysregulation. More studies are showing, and I've talked about this a lot in the last couple of years, how important the, micro, the gut microbiome is to the health of both children and adults. And at some point, we are going to have to, if we want to improve public health, we're going to have to translate this body of knowledge, which is quite significant, into uh, programs that tell parents the importance of, um, of having a child start life with a healthy microbiome, so uh, you know, vaginal birth, breastfeeding, these are things that can help. And then maintaining that microbiome throughout the lifespan, uh, one of the most important things one can do uh, to protect the microbiome is avoid antibiotics, if at all possible. And there's no question they save lives and there's a time to take them, but boy, do we prescribe and take too many of them here in the United States. Okay, next topic is this pesky glycemic index, which I've written off a long time ago, but it unfortunately is the subject of a lot of 
emails I get and confusion about health and that sort of thing, so I'm going to talk about it. According to a study that was conducted at Tufts University, the glycemic index is an unreliable indicator for choosing foods. Now, in case you're not familiar with it, the glycemic index is, it refers to how quickly glucose is absorbed from foods into the bloodstream when compared to the rate of absorption for just pure glucose. So what happens when you eat a food and it turns to glucose versus just pure glucose? The index is recommended to diabetics as a tool that might help them control their blood glucose levels and also to people in general as a means of reducing their risk of disease. So this particular research group led by Alice Lichtenstein evaluated the glycemic response of 14 patients with um, a sub exposed to 50 grams of carbohydrate, either in the form of white bread, the test food, or um, a liquid solution that had glucose, which was the control food. The experiment was repeated three times with each of the 14 people. Now, studies have shown that white bread has a glycemic index of 70, and in this study, the average of all of the patients landed about right at that place. The problem was that the individual values of the participants ranged from 44 to 132, and even more important than that, the responses in the same individual, because remember, they did this challenge three times with each person, they varied from time to time. And so what this really means is that the use of the glycemic index to make food choices of any type is extremely meaningless because the same patient doing the same thing doesn't produce the same result. Well, one of the many problems with the glycemic index is that fat and fiber content of the food, what else the person had to eat that day, all of that plays a role. And the other problem is that the way that the index is set up, it's the, it's the effect of eating one food at a time. So that's not the way people eat. I mean, in this case, they were using white bread, but most people aren't eating white bread by itself. It has butter on it, or it's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, or it's being eaten with spaghetti and marinara sauce. And, and so nobody knows the glycemic index of literally an unlimited number of foods and food combinations. So that makes it useless. And this study, by the way, isn't the only one that has arrived at this conclusion. An American Diabetes Association review of the glycemic index concluded, quote, in general, there is little difference in glycemic control and cardiovascular disease risk factors between low GI and high GI or other diets. An Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics review of five studies reported, quote, studies regarding the relationship of GI, glycemic index, independent of weight loss, reported no significant effect of A1C levels in adults um, with type 2 diabetes. No studies were identified in adults with type 1. Well, it's a useless index, but, but I would go on to say that the, this whole mentality of trying to find one thing that characterizes a food or focusing on one food is ridiculous. I mean, people are not going to get better by focusing on the glycemic index or focusing on a single food and its effect on health. That's not the way we eat anyway. It's only going to be by paying attention to the overall dietary pattern. So all this stuff just turns into, it aggravates me because it turns into a ginormous distraction from the types of things that would actually help people. And that, you know, I hate to see that. All right, as usual, I'll pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it. Uh, I will be back to you next Tuesday with more news.